All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Pavlos Protopavas, most of you know me. I'm the Scientific Program Director for the Institute for Applied Computation Science. Um, you're here for a seminar for our series, uh, bi-weekly, weekly seminar every Friday from 1 to 2, starting with amazing lunch. I'm getting, actually, these days more thank you and congratulations for the seminar series about the food rather than anything else. Um, so uh, we only have two more lectures after, after two more talks after this one, uh, actually three. On the 13th of November, we don't have the seminar next week, the 13th of November, Chris Jones from iRobot, he will be talking about how artificial intelligence is used for robots, followed by one of us uh, on the 20th about machine learning in astronomy and data mining in astronomy and data <coughs> science in astronomy. And on the 4th of uh, December, Bryce Meredith from uh, Citrine Informatics, he will be talking about how to use computational methods in designing materials. Um, next semester, we start at the end of January. All information on the website, you can find them. So today, I would like to introduce Sasha Rush. Sasha is an associate professor here at CIS. Most of you, you should know him or you're taking courses with him. Uh, he started as a Harvard undergrad, moved to MIT doing his PhD, though working in New York City with Columbia professor there. I think he liked New York City, that's why he was there. Then actually between, I think, undergrad and PhD, he was working in Facebook, then he did his PhD, then back to Facebook, and now with us. Uh, his interest of, is in data-driven methods for understanding natural language. He develops algorithms and systems for um, efficient language processing and always looking at creating a big corpus of uh, data from web and, and also does computational methods. Um, and he's working on st uh, structural aspects of language uh, such as syntactic parsing and things like, similar things like that. Uh, today he's talking about his work in uh, NLP, but using deep learning, uh, and I would like to introduce, uh, let uh, Raj tell us about that. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I had a speaker come yesterday for the computer science colloquium, and during the middle of her talk, she was talking about this subreddit where you could the challenge was to call people up and convince them to give you free pizza. And people will try all kinds of different things, like I'm a poor grad student, give me free pizza, or I have allergies to all food but pizza, I need pizza. But I think the right answer to this talk was I just need to give IACS colloquiums and I get lots of free pizza. So that's my, that's my strategy. Um, anyway, my name is Sasha Rush, uh, professionally I go by Alexander. Uh, what did you say? For sure, right. um, yeah, keep it coming. Um, so anyway, um, I'm a new professor here at Harvard Computer Science. Um, I think I may have gotten a promotion in the introduction. I'm an assistant professor. I just moved here um, in September. Um, my research group focuses on natural language processing and machine learning. And I teach an uh, undergraduate class on artificial intelligence, CS182. I think we have some people here. CS182, yay. Um, and I'll be teaching a class in the spring, uh, CS287, on statistical natural language processing. Today I'm going to talk about natural language processing and deep learning. I'm going to first begin by giving a contextual overview about exciting developments that have happened in a very recent time frame over the last several years that I think are shaking up the way we think about natural language processing. And then in the second half of the talk, I'll talk about work that uh, mainly my students and I are doing on topics in natural language processing and uh, deep learning. So I had this whole plan that I was going to dress up today. It's almost Halloween. I was going to do a whole Sherlock Holmes plan. I didn't get it together because I, it's kind of hard to buy houndstooth everything uh, for a talk. But I'm going to start with some examples. Um, I want to begin by trying to give you some context of what's kind of different between problems in image processing and natural language processing. And I'm going to do this because I, I guess some of you may have familiarity with how 
deep learning has transformed the field of vision and image processing applications. And because a lot of the methods I'll talk about in the talk today originate from methods that were originally developed for processing images. So when you have an image and you zoom in, say, on any given pixel, there's likely to be some kind of notion of smoothness used in a kind of very informal sense. So we look with our like magnifying glass at a particular image on this page, and you actually can't see this, but this is pixelized. This is zoomed in really deep. So there's a bunch of pixels there, and from any one of these pixels, you can roughly get a sense of where the neighboring, neighboring pixels are gonna lie, what they'll look like. And the reason I point this out is because this is crucial for a lot of uh, vision applications, but we really don't have the same property at all in language. Given the sentence like, it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data, insensibly one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. If you think of each of those words as a data point, they're all pretty much categorical. They're just a random value, maybe indexed from zero to the size of your vocabulary. But given any one of them as a number, you can't really know much about the surrounding words inherently just from the words themselves. Now, why does this matter? Well, in image processing, they sometimes work on this task called uh, image impainting or image repair. So if we take this famous picture and we scroll all over it, we can roughly recover the original image by taking advantage of the smoothness or regularity properties about the surrounding pixels. Just from the image itself, you can roughly repair back what you expected to see by taking advantage of this smoothness. What's pretty cool is that you can do the same thing in language. So given the beginning prefix of the sentence we saw before, it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has blank. You might not be able to remember exactly what the word that filled that spot was, but you can tell what words it's definitely not gonna be. You're definitely not gonna repeat the word has. And you're probably not gonna add a verb in there. Um, but even with kind of nouns, you can kind of distinguish between nouns that are more likely and nouns that are less likely. Uh, for instance, uh, you probably wouldn't put the word pizza in there. It might fit, it might be an interesting joke, but it's probably not the most likely word to see next. Whereas the word data would likely have high probability as something that would smoothly fit into that slot. So what I'm getting at Oh, let me also mention this. Playing the kind of transformation that I talked about before, if we imagine that each of these words is simply mapped to a number, you, this, this question becomes basically impossible. Just from these representations as numbers, you can't possibly predict what's next gonna be in that slot. Uh, I mean, the word pizza and the word data and the word has just become arbitrary <laughs> integers that may or may not fit with that pattern. So I guess what I'm hinting at is that if we are ever going to hope to have smoothness for language, we have to utilize data. The reason you were able to make that prediction was because you've seen lots and lots of sentences and you have a good model in your head over what the probability of the next word should be conditioned on all the words you've seen to that point. So I'm gonna come back to this formula many times throughout this talk. We want to find the probability of the next word given the previous words that you've seen up until that point and we wanna learn that from examples in data. Now so far, I've kind of only given you toy language examples, but I wanna emphasize that this is neither a new task nor a toy one. It was a task that was originally proposed by Shannon when he was developing information theory, and it's currently used in basically all interesting applications of language uh, that you might wanna play with, or not all of them, but a, a, large, a large variety of languages, uh, language tasks. So speech recognition, machine translation, forms of summary that we'll see later in this talk, dialogue, soft keyboards and typing, word correction, text simplification. And there's probably several different language models going on right now in your phone. So how do you build one of these things? Well, if you asked me how to do it before 2010, I think I'd be able to tell you what I thought was the right answer. I would say, 
you're going to do the following. You're going to make a Markov assumption. So instead of looking at the whole prefix of all the previous words, you're going to cut it off at a fixed point. We'll say we'll just look at the last n minus 1 words and use those to estimate a distribution over the next word. Then you run the following recipe. You get a corpus. Corpus is what we call a text data set. There's a pretty good corpus. You can um, uh, take every English web page ever made, and that's it. That's your corpus. It's nice. You can get it online. Um, and you, you count up all the different n-grams that you see. And I'm being a little bit facetious with this, this recipe here, but, but roughly this is how it works. You count up all the times you've seen every, say, 5 gram, and divide between, by all the times you've seen the previous context. So you have theorize before one has data, divided by theorize before one has, and that gives you the probability of seeing the word data in the next slot. In practice, because you don't see a lot of five grams that often, you have to do what's called smoothing and kind of not just take the maximum likelihood estimate of this distribution. But I think that's less important. More what I want to get across is that this is the computational method for constructing the language model. And it works reasonably well. And it's still built into most language modeling systems. And here's how you evaluate a language model. So given this distribution, which you've learned from data, you want to compute a value called perplexity. So perplexity is the exponential transform of the negative log likelihood of held out data. So we collect some data that we didn't use when estimating our language model. We hold it out. We compute the likelihood that our language model gives to that data, and we do an exponential transform on that. That's how we do it mathematically. Kind of, uh, what it actually means is it corresponds to the effective vocabulary with this language model. So it's the size of the vocabulary of a uniform distribution that's equally predictive to the language model you've learned. So a famous data set for um, lots of NLP tasks is the Wall Street Journal corpus, or the Penn Tree Bank. And this consists of a vocabulary of 10,000 word types. It also consists of data consisting of 1 million word tokens. So vocabulary is 10,000 and with 1 million words. If we have a uniform distribution for our language model, the perplexity would be 10,000. But if we use the method I described earlier, with a type of smoothing called knesser nye smoothing, that gets us down to a perplexity of 141. So we've reduced the size of the vocabulary effect effectively to 141 uniform words. Now let me get to the punchline of this section of the talk. Over the last decade, researchers have been developing methods based on what's called deep learning. It corresponds roughly to what you may have seen as neural network approaches to machine learning. Over the last five years, particularly, there's a type of model of this sort called a recurrent neural network, which has had a really disruptive effect in the way we think about a lot of problems in natural language processing. The recurrent neural network doesn't make this Markov Markovian assumption. It models directly the probability of the next word given all the previous words it's seen. And that could mean all the previous words in a sentence, but actually, in practice, it often means all the previous words in the entire corpus. Okay? So you're not making any locality assumption here with the probability model. So if you want to model the probability of the word data, given the context, it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has, you're looking at all those words when making the decision. Now, there's a certain type of recurrent neural network called a long short-term memory neural network, which was developed in the 90s but has now been kind of tuned and perfected for tasks like language modeling. This network has brought the perplexity on this data set, on the Wall Street Journal data set, this is work from 2014, down to a perplexity of 78. Now there's some caveats here. This is a rather small data set as language modeling goes, and it's possible that through lots and lots of work, the hyperparameters have kind of been overfit to this data set. But still, take a, like, take a second to think about what that means. Before, we had an effective vocabulary for this task of 140 words. Now we're at 78 words. 
and it opens up all kinds of interesting tasks in language processing that would have been very difficult to do before simply because we didn't have really strong models of the smoothness of how language works. So this is one of the reasons why people in this field are very excited about this work and why there's a, a lot of thought going into this right now in natural language research. So what I'm gonna do now is kind of walk you through at a high level what's happening inside of this model. Now there's a, a lot of kind of mathematical technicalities to this that I'll be somewhat pushing over. If you have any questions, please interrupt me and I can try to explain in more detail. But I wanted to try to give you a high level sense about what's happening when you apply an LSTM to data. Yeah? It seems that the intent is to reduce perplexity. That's correct. Uh, is it related to complexity? Because I saw you had a log of a probability there. So is it something like an inverse? Because you had also an exponential. It's related to entropy. Right. So it's related very closely. Yes. Yeah, so this so perplexity is related very closely to the entropy of the distribution that you have compared to what the true value would be. Okay. So yeah. A, you actually compare it to the real. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Let's, um, so at the top here, this this probability, I, and I again, I I should write this out more formally, but this probability is on held out data. So it's the, the literal probability of the, of the correct value based on the distribution you estimate. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. So there are three kind of central ideas going on inside of a recurrent neural network for language modeling. The first idea is we want to map from categorical word uh, words to vectors in a low dimensional vector space. So we'll assume we have a vocabulary which is the size of V and we want to learn a matrix U where each of the rows correspond to words and each of the columns correspond to the representation of these words in this lower dimensional vector space. So we might have the word theorize which gets mapped to this vector, before which gets mapped to this vector, one that gets mapped to this vector. Now there's been a lot written about kind of the meaning of these vectors, and when you look at them, you can actually see certain properties, like um, based on dot product vectors that have similar meaning, maybe closer or further away. Um, but for now, just assume we have some mapping that we're gonna learn from each of the words in our vocabulary to this space. And the space may be around, say, 256, say, floats for every word in our dictionary. Now the second step is going to be to combine the word vectors for all of the words in the prefix of our language model. So we're gonna have a vector H, which we'll refer to as our hidden vector. We can initialize it to say zero. And then at each step, we're gonna take the vector representation of the next word and combine it with the hidden representation at the last step. And this combination function, I'm gonna just write as F. So this function takes the last hidden representation and a new vector representation for the word, and it just produces a new hidden representation. And then the final step is to do the following. We're gonna learn another vector, which is gonna correspond to the output word representation. So it's of the same form as U, which we just saw, but it corresponds to words that you wanna output. And what we'll do is we'll calculate a score for each one of the words in our vocabulary of the dot product of its output representation with the current hidden representation. So if H here represents our hidden representation and V sub data represents the output representation of the word data and V sub pizza represents the output representation of pizza, we'll have a higher dot product for data then we'll have for pizza, okay? And we're also going to learn these representations from data. But I wanna kind of emphasize what's happening here. Basically by converting words from discrete representations to this vector space, we were able to manipulate these vectors such that we're able to get a notion of smoothness. 
where that notion of smoothness now exists in this vector space that we've created. So the word we want to produce next really is closest in dot product to the hidden representation representing the context that we're in. Okay. Um, so there are a couple more details. So we have a score now for every word at the output. We want to turn those scores into probabilities. To do that, we apply a transformation which is called the softmax transformation, which is we just take the exponential of each of the scores and divide it by the sum of the exponential of all the other possible words. Um, this isn't crucial. This just turns what was just a ranking function into a, a probability distribution. Finally, a crucial point that I wasn't totally explicit about before is that the whole thing is trained end to end. We're going to train the output vectors, we're going to train the input vectors, and we're going to train this function f all together. And they're all going to get gradients from the same source, which is that we want to maximize the perplexity of our training set. So we're going to take our training data, we're going to compute what the predictions are from this model, we're going to compare those to the correct prediction, we'll calculate gradients, and then we'll update all of the parameters that we have together based on that decision. So we're not going to like train the input embedding separately from the output, or separately from the middle part. It's all just one model trained together. And this is what it looks like when it's done. You have these input representations. They create hidden representations, which are then used to produce scores over our vocabulary. And then we update as we go. Okay. So this is the kind of general framework. Um, and this is mostly it. This mostly gets you to where you want to get to. But there are a couple caveats that I thought I should mention, because these often get, get left off. Doing this in practice is actually pretty hard, and it took a lot of exploration of many different aspects of machine learning to get this model to work on this task so well. So the first caveat is that uh, I said the model we use is called an LSTM. Uh, this is what an LSTM looks like. Uh, I'm not going to go totally into the details of this, but roughly this combination function f that takes the hidden representation and transforms it based on the next word is rather complicated. Um, it keeps around all kinds of pieces of information and carries forward different, different pieces. Um, and kind of the high level reason is that to train all these models together and to get gradients to back propagate, they call it, through the entire model, you have to be careful with what functions you're using and how stable they are in practice. So it turns out that using this particular function works particularly well for the language modeling problem. The second caveat is that the model you're using is nonlinear and non-convex. So you're going to get a local optima when you optimize it. Um, and I think for a long time people thought this was like a real intractable problem that would be very difficult to get around. Uh, it still is, but it seems not to matter too much in practice. You can learn really good models, even though the underlying function is very complicated. The third issue is that this required a lot of hyperparameter tuning and clever forms of regularization. So in practice, you're doing a bunch of regularization on top of what I showed you. And to get the regularization to work well, you kind of have to tune these hyperparameters. So I think a lot of grid search went into finding a model that would work really well for language modeling. That being said, on the other hand, we basically used the same hyperparameters that worked for this one data set on all the different data sets we work on, and they seem to carry over relatively well. So it's not clear you need to do this on kind of every problem that you look into. And then finally, the last point, which is one that uh, I, I'm thinking a lot about these days, is that training is really complex. You go from a model that you could just count things up and divide to a model that really requires you to do a lot of linear algebra to do the, the trivialest thing. So you see that sum at the bottom there? You need to calculate that sum for every word in your data set. So let's say you have a million words. A million, by the way, is one of the smallest data sets we work with. And the vocabulary is 10,000. You end up having to do a sum with a large amount of linear algebra for every 10,000 vocabulary word for every one million words you have in your training set. So calculating that sum is incredibly annoying. 
and it makes everything really slow. And the only way we're able to get around that is because we can do that using GPUs for training. And it just so happens that the hardware that was developed for doing graphics processing is incredibly useful for doing a lot of things in machine learning, particularly things that involve taking sums over very similar looking linear algebra terms. So we rely on that really heavily to do kind of things in practice. Okay, so that's where we're at as a community in terms of deep learning. I'm gonna talk now about three projects that my research group has been working on using methods that I was discussing earlier, but applied to specific problems in natural language processing. Um, before I do that, I'll see if there's any questions though. Okay, you guys are less talkative than my undergrads. Um, so my research group is particularly interested in structural questions involving language. And one thing that bothers us is that to do anything in natural language processing, you really have to do a lot of pre-processing. So if you want to do, say, a problem in Arabic, you have to think about how do I segment the words? How do I split off endings? How do I determine um, what their kind of morphological type is? How do I figure out what their part of speech is? How do I then figure out the syntactic structure of the sentence? How do I figure out what role each word plays in the semantic structure of the sentence? How do I chain together two sentences and figure out what their discourse relation is? These are all things that you kind of run as pre-processing to do the thing that you actually want to do. And the problem with this is that we're relatively good at all these tasks. But when we put them together, there's all kinds of pipelining issues of like you screwed something up in your earlier stage and then you have to deal with it later. Um, plus it just feels aesthetically kind of ugly to have to do all of these things independently as you go. So, for us, I think what seems the most exciting about these kind of new developments in deep learning is questions of how can we capture these linguistic aspects but do it in a non-explicit way. So instead of predicting each of the aspects of language, can we have latent representations that maybe exist in these vector spaces that capture the structures we wish to know about? And furthermore, what kind of architectural elements, what kind of um, what kind of functions do we want to be including to best learn these latent representations to help with the tasks we're interested in? And I'm going to talk about these two questions for three different problems, each at different scales of language. So the first is uh, for character-aware language modeling. So this is going to be at the <laughs> lowest scale possibly. We're going to try to break through this kind of notion that words are each unique and atomic and look at the character structure of the words as part of our models. The second problem I'll talk about is called sentence summarization. Here we're gonna take a long sentence and try to produce a shorter one that maintains the semantics of the original sentence, but possibly uses entirely different words. And the third problem I'll talk about is called co-reference resolution, and this is at a larger document scale. And for this problem, we're given a phrase, and we wanna match it to a previous phrase in the document that refers to the same underlying entity. So if you have a noun and then later on you say he, we want to match that he to the noun that it was referring to previously in the document. So all three of these are relatively different tasks at different scales of language, but we're going to use very similar machine learning techniques for each of these approaches, and all of them will use slightly different architectures. The first is going to use something called a convolutional neural network. The second will use something called a contextual attention mechanism. And the final one will use uh, an idea called feature embedding. So even if you don't care about the language problem, hopefully you can take, a, take something away from the architectures of these approaches. So the first is character-aware language models. So for this problem, we're going to be using almost an identical model to the one I described in the first half of this talk. We have an LSTM language model. And that language model makes the assumption, which we saw, that there is a single vector representation of every word in the vocabulary. So 
if we have the words called, call, calling, recalling, and recalled, uh, that's hard to say, uh, they're each going to have a different representation in this matrix U. Okay? But in practice, we'd like to share some information between these words. They all kind of have the same stem, and they have just various prefixes and suffixes. And in English, this is mainly an issue because a word like recalled is not seen that many times. So the y-axis in this graph is how many times a word is seen, and this is for the vocabulary from 0 to 10,000. And what it's pointing out is this property called Zipf's Law, which is that English has very, or any language, has very few words that are seen a ton of times, and very many words that are just not seen that often. So we may only see recalled twice, but we'd like to take advantage of the fact that we've seen called many times in our data set. This is why it might be helpful for English. It is also crucially helpful for languages where morphology and prefixes and suffixes play an important, a more important syntactic role. So in morphologically rich languages like Russian or like, say, Latin, where you have um, endings that encode syntactic meaning, you want to be able to take into account all this extra information. So we obviously didn't invent this idea. This is a very kind of basic idea that you want to take this into account. But most previous methods have relied very heavily on morphological analysis before running a language model. So they'll take a morphological segmenter and split the word recalling up into re, call, and ing. And then use each of those parts in order to get a representation that they can use in a language model. So this work by Alice Drescu and Kirchhoff and it was based on work by Bilms and Kirchhoff in 2006 that looked at kind of factored versions of the count language models that we've seen that were able to take into account this morphological structure. There also have been two papers recently that have used neural networks to utilize the structure from these uh, morphemes, the subparts, in order to better predict the next word. In this paper, we're going to throw that away entirely. We're going to work completely with the characters of the word itself. So to do this, we're going to use a model that's very commonly used in vision, which is called a convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural networks are central to a lot of the recent revolutions in deep learning in vision. This is from a model uh, that was uh, from 1989 that's called a uh, LacuneNet, or, um, and it runs basically this thing called a convolutional filter over the image. This was for a problem of digit recognition, or in this case, character recognition, producing kind of various representations of the original problem based on these filters. Okay. This convolutional networks have also been used in natural language processing. They're often used to take, say, a sentence of words and you run the convolution over the words themselves to produce a representation of your full sentence or document. Uh, and this has been used to really good success for problems like sentence classification, but also for problems like part of speech tagging and semantic role labeling. So this is a very common idea, and I'm going to show you how it works and how we apply it to natural language processing at the character level. So this is what our model is going to look like. So at the top, we have a long short-term LSTM recurrent neural net language model. So this is what I showed you in the first half of the talk. Feeding into that, we're going to have a convolutional network over the characters. So it takes this word absurdity, and for each of the characters, it maps them to a vector representation. Then it runs these filters that look at sequences of characters in order to produce representations, which are then fed in to the long short-term memory network. We also have this other aspect in here called a highway network, uh, which I'm not going to talk about too much in this talk, but you can think of it as just kind of uh, an extra hidden layer that transforms the representation that came out of our convolutional layer. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is show you an animation 
of what happens when we run the convolutional network over our word to produce its representation. So I'm gonna use some math, but I think mostly pictures to do this. So we have the word absurdity. We're gonna learn a matrix Q. This matrix is very similar to the matrix U we saw early in the talk. It has a vector representation of each character. Each one of these columns represents that representation. So the size of D here is four. We're then gonna learn a transformation matrix um, which is called H. H uh, has this parameter D, which is four, the size of these representations, but also a width, or what's called a kernel width W. The kernel width of this here is three, so that says it looks at three characters that happen to be in a row at the same time. Then we're gonna apply this matrix to each position from left to right in this matrix. At each stage, we're gonna take basically a matrix dot product plus a bias term, and then a tan H nonlinearity to produce a new uh, term which we'll call H1. We'll then continue to run this across from left to right, this representation of the characters, at each time producing a new uh, kind of feature that came from this convolution, sorry, from this kernel applied to that position. We'll then get to the end of the sentence and we'll have basically around, uh, let's see, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these values. Now because all words are of different lengths, we need to then take this representation and produce one that is of a fixed length. We do this by applying an operation called pooling. And there are many different types of pooling, but the one we apply is called max over time pooling. So this produces the single highest scoring value from that convolution passed over that data. Now, we do this many times with filters of many different sizes. So here we have a filter with width two that's learned separately. We run that from left to right over the data and we produce a new uh, representation from that. So that's basically what the model does. It runs these convolution operations to produce a vector, and instead of sending through the vector that we got from the lookup table, we now send this vector that we get from this representation. So that's what this looks like. So the yellow, blue, and red part at the top get fed through the network and then get fed into the LSTM. So, let's look at some results. So, the models at the top are models we built for our paper. We were able to replicate somewhat the LSTM large results. So, our LSTM word large is the standard baseline I showed you at the beginning of the talk. And that gets to about 85.4 perplexity. On the right side of the, the slide, I have the number of parameters the model required. So as you can see, the character model actually requires fewer parameters because it doesn't need an embedding of every word, but only every character. Our best model at the bottom, LSTM char CNN large, gets to 78.9. The best result in the literature is this result I mentioned earlier, which gets to 78.4. Note that that model uses many more parameters, about 52 million compared to ours, which is around 20 million. So this is neat, but we're around the same perplexity level. We got some gains in terms of space. But I think what I found particularly neat about this model is what happens when you apply it to other languages. Languages where morphology plays a more important role in the structure of the language. So we got a bunch of data sets from English, Czech, German, Spanish, French, and Russian. For all languages, we have a data set with around one million words and a data set with around 50 million words. Note something interesting though, that if you're in English uh, and you have one million words, you have a vocabulary of about 10,000. If you go up to 20 million words, your vocabulary increases a bit to about 60,000. But when you're in Russian and you have 25 million words, you have a vocabulary of 500,000. 
This gives you a sense of why I was stressing out earlier about that sum. To train a model in Russian with 25 million tokens, at every token, at every iteration of training, you have to do a sum over 500,000 things. Okay? So this like blew up all of our GPUs when we did it, but we were able to run it over, say, I think about a week time. Um, but it also hints at the fact that morphology plays a much bigger role in Russian, that it's more common to produce new words just because you've changed, say, the ending or elements of the word itself. So here's what it looks like when you utilize these morphological aware language models on these languages. So first off, this is the count-based language model. This is the recipe I gave you at the beginning of the talk. These uh, perplexies on the left side here, I don't know if you can read them. It goes up to 600 at the top and about 100 at the bottom. The languages are Czech, German, Spanish, French, and Russian. When we switch to a word neural language model that takes into account the whole word structure, this is the LSTM that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, you get a, a nice advantage, a nice improvement across all of these languages. Now, when you incorporate a language model that runs a pre-processing step to find the morpheme structure and adds those in as embeddings with the words themselves, then you get a further jump. This model is aware of the fact that Russian has lots of different endings and pre-segments those endings out. But what was most surprising when we ran these experiments is that the character model, which doesn't have that at all, actually does better that by not kind of predefining what the morphological structure was, but allowing it to kind of search over all possibilities, you actually get a further improvement even over this very strong baseline. And across all these languages, you get a significant gain in perplexity, particularly compared to our first result. Yeah? How does the timing process differ? So, um, so at runtime, basically all those three last models are around the same speed. And they're, they're slower than the first model. Um, and that's when you run on a GPU. So if you're running um, on a CPU, all the models that use the, the neural language modeling will be somewhat slower. Um, but there are various tricks that people run in practice to, to actually utilize these, these models. Yeah. Cool. Um, OK. So then that was for. Uh, the small data sets, we also ran on the big data sets uh, with a smaller size model, which is about all we could process through. And you get uh, similar improvements. For some reason, we don't do as well as a baseline in Russian, but we're looking into that now um, to see exactly why, why that's happening. But across Czech, German, Spanish, and English, you actually get improvements even on these much bigger data sets. So, one thing that people often do for these models is they look at the representations that they produce for the words. And you take, say, the nearest neighbors for each word in this representation space. So at the top here, we have the representation of each of the words, and below that, the nearest neighbors that were found by the standard language model and by the character-based language model. So you get some weird things, like our model thinks that this is close to the word his. So clearly they're not similar words, but because they have similar character structure, this is the kind of mistake that our model will make. However, it's also able to find words that are very different, like nevertheless and although, just based on the fact that it's trained on enough data and it's able to learn transformations that can get it there, even from the character structure itself. So perhaps even more interesting, though, is words that were never seen in the data set. So when given words like computer-aided, it has to find nearest neighbors that did exist in the data set itself. And so it's able to find that computer-guided should have a similar representation to this novel word that it's never seen before, which is computer-aided. And this is something that would be very difficult for a model that's just based on the words itself to be able to do. Similarly for misinformed, although I guess performed is quite different. And for misspellings like look. OK. OK, I'm going to talk about the next result. Uh, were there any questions about language modeling?
Yeah. If you're doing this from spoken language, yeah. do you first do a translation into a, a written representation and then? Yeah, so I, I don't work too much on speech recognition, but my sense is they maintain what's called a lattice that represents all the different possible things a speech signal could produce. And then they run a language model over that lattice to try to produce the path that makes the most sense in the language it's producing. So the, the famous example is um, recognize speech. If you think about that, that basically phonetically could be recognize speech, rec a nice beach, but recognize speech, but the language model separates those two out. So uh, Fitzit is basically an intrinsic evaluation metric. It tells you how well does the model actually, uh, how well does the model perform in terms of like uh, representing the collection. Have you done, uh, uh, when it comes to different languages and including the language model, uh, clearly gains in perplexity. Have you evaluated the actual language model on uh, in terms of the performance of the machine translation engine? Great question. We haven't run that yet. It's, it's the next thing that we're working on. What we want to do though is uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this briefly at the end of the talk. The architecture that we have is only looking at the characters at the input phase. It's not able to produce, say, novel words with different character representations on the output phase. That part's exactly the same as it was. To do, to do machine translation, we'd like to be able to generate words based on their character structure as opposed to just picking them from a bag of, of vocabulary. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually we did. Um, so the question was, what about informal domains? Um, so we really wanted to try it on Twitter because uh, I think there are a lot of misspellings and we wanted to capture whether it got orthography. We couldn't find, I think Twitter is being a little hard with their data these days. So we tried it on Reddit. So all of Reddit is basically publicly available. And we found it actually didn't really improve much. And when we looked at the Reddit data, we found that it was like pretty well spelled and pretty good language. So I think uh, it's either that uh, phones and computers have such good correction these days that people rarely misspell words, or maybe we have been underestimating Reddit as a data source. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. So the, the result of the filters is different width is equally weighted? The different width are equally weighted? Yeah, a good question. Um, I believe that there's no weighting that we add to it. We just throw them all in, and then it learns the weighting. Um, but I don't think we've looked in detail at how it weights the different widths that it produced. Uh, so I think that would be an interesting thing to look at, if that was your question. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah. About, um, Russian makes it a lot more complex for the different roots for different words. Uh, what about in the opposite direction? If you have a language with a lot of like homonyms, uh -huh. or you have exactly the same word, uh, I would imagine that would throw off the sort of vector representation of the words. Uh, yeah, have that's a... looked into that? So... Because I'm not, I'm not, I don't speak the language, I'm not sure, but I think uh, Korean uh -huh. in, in writing typically has a lot more homonyms than the English language. Okay. So it would be interesting sort of to see how this would do on, on a language like that. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so I think these, both these models would handle language with homonyms identically. So there wouldn't be any advantage for one or the other. But there'd be an, there's an interesting question of what you might do for a language that has a lot of homonyms. You might, for instance, want to learn a kind of a multimodal um, word map that has, say, different vector representations based on which homonym it thinks it is. But uh, it's not something we've looked at yet. Although the, the student who, who did this work, Yoon Kim, is Korean, so he might be interested in looking at that. Yeah. Any other questions? So I, I, should, I should also mention that again. So this is the work of Yoon Kim, a graduate student who I work with. OK, so I'm going to talk next about the next piece of work. Um, I am not nearly going to get through everything, so I'm just going to spend the next five minutes talking about this work. and. Uh, you can look at my website for other stuff we've worked on. So this is a very different problem. The problem here is sentence summarization. This is a source sentence we might get. Russian Defense Minister Ivanov called Sunday for the creation of a joint front for combating global terrorism. 
here's a target summary that we might want to produce. Russia calls for a joint front against terrorism. This summary exhibits several different linguistic phenomena. It has generalization. We took the phrase Russian defense minister and substituted it with the more general term Russia. It has deletion. This term Sunday is just dropped entirely in our summarization itself. And probably most interesting is that it has paraphrase. Joint front for combating global terrorism is replaced with the simple word against. Now, there are many different types of sentence summarization that people work on. There is abstractive, compressive, and extractive. In compressive, we're simply trying to delete words to get a shorter representation that maintains some of the meaning. I personally find this a little bit boring. In extractive, we can kind of take out phrases and maybe rearrange them, but we can't produce any new words. And then in abstractive, we're allowed to do whatever the heck we want. Um, now, abstractive is a slightly rare area, and it's kind of hard. And the tricky aspect is you don't totally know if you're keeping the semantics of the original guy. However, when uh, people look at human summarizers, and this is work by Jing in 2002, and the operations that they, they apply when they do summarization, there are a whole lot of operations that can only be captured if we allow kind of full flexibility in how we produce the summary itself. So things like lexical paraphrasing, generalization, full syntactic transformation. You need to have at least some flexibility in how you do the summary itself. So there's been some work on abstractive summarization. And the various methods all kind of rely on linguistic preprocessing, as I was saying earlier, in order to produce the output representation. So in syntax-based summarization, they get the syntax tree. They kind of prune it based on things they think are OK to drop. In topic-based summarization, they run a kind of unsupervised topic modeling-like approach and try to capture words that seem on topic. In machine translation-based summary, which is actually closest to this work, you kind of run a machine translation system that translates from English to English, but in a summarized way. And there's been some work recently on semantics-based approaches where you try to come up with a full semantic representation of the original sentence and then throw away things that aren't necessary in that representation. Now, in this work, we took inspiration from recent results in deep learning for natural language processing that were developed for machine translation. These models use an approach which is called an attention-based approach for translation. And the way they do it is they produce a soft alignment that aligns the sentence they're translating with the sentence, their source sentence, the one that they're using to generate the translation. But they don't enforce that it's an exact match. They allow a kind of soft informing of the thing they're using to do translation from the sentence they're given. And they learn that in a similar way to what we talked about earlier by using word embeddings and a recurrent neural network over the source sentence. Okay, What's nice about this compared to maybe a classical approach for machine translation is that, again, it has no kind of pre-processing or requirement that we first align our training sets. You can do it just by training the model end-to-end -end on a large set of examples. So. I'm going to skip over the math, but roughly what we're doing here is we take our source sentence x and we want to generate words w. We're going to generate those words by using a language model. We're just going to produce the, the distribution over the next set of words, and we're going to pick, pick the highest one at every point. Okay, But we're going to inform that language model with the source sentence. So it's given the source sentence, and it uses that to help it inform what the language modeling decision should be. But it doesn't take the entire source sentence. It learns a distribution that maps it to parts of the source sentence that are relevant given the current step in summary. So this is what it looks like. So we've generated so far Russia calls, and we want to produce four as the next word. So based on the previous words, it produces this histogram which is a distribution over how important it thinks all the words in the source sentence are. And then it only looks at an area of them, which I've drawn as a Q, that's directly surrounding 
the areas with high probability. As you go, you, at every stage, you get one of these distributions. So here's a distribution over the words based on Russia calls for, and it looks right around here, for the creation of. Now it's not limited to that area. So in this example, it generates the word joint, even though that's not an area where there's explicitly high mass, because the language model is telling it that's a good decision, even if that's not exactly where the attention is focusing. As it goes, you get some places where there's a very high match. So here, joint is almost all of the match, and that's pushing it to generate a word that's nearby to joint in the sentence. So here you get front, and as you go, you generate the whole summary. Okay, this is what it looks like at the end. This heat map shows the distribution at each time step and where it's looking at in the source sentence. Okay, so let me just tell you briefly how we train this, and I'll end there. So we took a large set of AP Newswire stories. We took the title of these stories, and we took the first paragraph. So Germany introduced temporary border control Sunday, dot, 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 and we tried to predict the title from that first sentence. Now, Passwork has done this before, but we did it at an entirely new scale. So we took 3.8 million articles from seven different Newswire services. We have a source vocabulary of 110,000 with an average sentence length of 31 tokens. We have titles that are average length of about eight tokens and a vocabulary of 69,000. And on average, there is some overlap between the two, but not that much. So in the first 75 words of the, the first sentence, only 2.6 words on average match with the title. Sorry, 75 characters. Okay, and um, here are results. So um, we compared to a bunch of baselines. I'll just summarize them briefly. Uh, these are the baselines that are basically were the state of the art before we worked on this task. They're all trained on a much smaller scale. When you have the combination of this data and improvements in language modeling, you're able to generate summaries, uh, which are this bottom blue line here, which are much closer to uh, the actual performance of the titles. Um, yeah, okay, cool. Okay, um, I think uh, here are some examples. <laughs> okay, I, anyway, uh, no worries. Uh, I have too much, okay, should, should you stop for questions? Or? Okay. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs> <laughs>